So I'd like to thank the organizers. Um, it's just great to be here. What a fascinating, uh, fascinating day. Thanks a lot for inviting me to, uh, to present on this work. So um, this is part of an ongoing research program with Camille Yilmaz, uh, a former student from a long, long time ago, who's been at Coates University in uh, Istanbul for, for many, many uh, decades now. And um, there are four or five papers. Um, in some sense, we've sort of written the same paper five times, but it keeps getting better and different applications and you know, kind of build things up as we go. So this is sort of the latest and greatest. And we, and we, added, two, we added two people. Um, Mert Demeyer is a student of Camille's who's now a PhD student at MIT, and Laura Liu is my PhD student uh, at Penn <coughs> right now. She's on the market. She's great. The, um, <laughs> This is also not her job market paper. She's got a lot of good stuff. Um, <clears throat> okay. So I know you're all dying for time series, dynamics. I'm going to do some time series. I'm going to do some dynamics. We're going to have network sorts of things. I'm going to use some network technology to help us to understand a fairly high dimensional, about 100 dimensional vector auto regression. We're going to use centrality type measures. We're going to use crucially, network visualization tools. Uh, we're also going to need to regularize the estimation. We're going to need to shrink, select. We're going to do that with lasso. Um, there's several varieties of, of big data actually going on here. I like to talk about what I would I call tall, wide, and dense data. Tall and wide, just think of the X matrix in the regression. It, you know, so it's tall if it's got a lot of rows in it, like a lot of time periods if it's over time, or you know, cases, whatever. And, and, and wide is you know, the number of regressors. Uh, so tall and wide. But there's also dense, uh, which has to do with how frequently are we sampling. And in financial econometrics, right, work a fair amount, that, that's a big deal. Um, trading is occurring in deep liquid markets at you know, many tens of thousands of trades per second. And we can get, and we, routine, we routinely to, do get, you know, trade by trade um, data and so on. So there's the dense, it's not just the calendar span, but for any given calendar span of a sample, how densely are we infilling in terms of uh, the sampling. And we're going to be making use of both dense and, and fairly um, wide data, again, 100 dimensions. But these are going to be, um, it's going to wind up being about 100 um, banks, uh, about 3,000 days of realized volatilities, empirical quadratic variations for each bank. And they are constructed by using the high frequency intraday sample path, <coughs> high and low in particular, which are key objects, uh, obviously, for volatility. So, um, so there's a lot going on that might be of interest. Um, and, and we are very interested in this substantive application uh, as well. So I'll tell you a bit about that um, in due course. So to get us all on the same page, um, you know, just let's, let's think about what I'm going to call connectedness. And we're going to focus on financial bank stock return volatility connectedness eventually. Uh, but for now, think about all sorts of things in finance and macro and many other areas too. This is going to be a general technology for characterizing in certain very precise ways connectedness in a potentially high dimensional system. And we're going to roll it and make it dynamic so that we can also look at time variation in that connectedness. And in contexts like this, we might be interested in, you know, during the Great Recession, what happened, you know, stuff like that. OK, so anyway, just um, kind of a, not a random list, but you could certainly make this list much, much longer. But just think about all the standard things and in, in, in a lot of standard things in finance. And I put one macroeconomic thing at the bottom also. Macro things like consumption streams are just the fundamentals that are getting priced in financial markets. So, so there's a natural duality. Counterparty risk or multilateral gridlock you know, kind of risk, of, of course, by definition. That's about connectedness due to social or legal or institutional or other uh, reasons, uh, cross holdings on balance sheets, uh, whatever. Systemic risk, I'm not, I've never been exactly sure what systemic risk means. It's one of these slippery concepts, uh, and, and people fight violently uh, you know, about what it might mean. But whatever you think systemic risk means, surely there's some notion of system wide, everybody tanking at once. Uh, so again, uh, connectedness. Business cycle, uh, more of a macro thing, but of course, um, the whole discussion about the global business cycle and its evolution and you know, s coupling and decoupling and recoupling or synchronization, and, you know, that's all about connectedness. So um, you know, just, it's everywhere. 
Now, notice I didn't say correlation or covariance. Because we're going to, you know, these are financial markets. Things are generally not Gaussian and not necessarily linear. So, you know, obviously covariance, uh, well, it's linear and Gaussian. It's also pairwise. And we could do things like look at every pairwise correlation and average them or something. But, you know, we can do a lot of things. We want to be more um, careful, hopefully. Okay, so we're going to work. It's, it turns out that it's completely acceptable, I, I believe, to work uh, in a covariance stationary environment here. We're going to be looking at um, realized volatilities on, on a bunch of equity returns. Volatilities definitely do move around, and they definitely are uh, quite highly persistent, uh, but they de definitely do mean revert. Um, so um, we're going to be in a covariance stationary environment. So uh, everything in population for the moment. So imagine a world representation there. So the dynamics, of course, are summarized <coughs> by the polynomial B of L. We've got innovations, epsilon, covariance matrix, not diagonal necessarily, um, of those innovations um, given by sigma. Now, any, you know, this is all there is, right? This is the environment. So any connectedness measure I write down has to be a function of whatever variable it, it is that I'm talking about. X is the vector of variables here. The dynamics and, and, and the innovation, um, and there's nothing else. <coughs> So the question is, well, what, is, what are we going to do? How are we going to think about connectedness? Okay. And we're going to do a very precise definition, certainly not the only thing that one might do, but we find it very flexible and also very familiar to economists. And it answers, it's based on answering questions that economists care a lot about. And that is um, variance decompositions. Okay. So the variance decomposition question um, is, is as follows. Pick a horizon H, and we could do a whole menu of H. But you know, what fraction of H step ahead prediction error variance of variable I is due to shocks originating not in variable I, but in variable J? And we could do that for any or all I and J that we care to look at. And right away, that's telling, you know, if, if, if most of the, the future uncertainty, just to put it loosely, that I'm facing is due to shocks originating not with me, but with Serena, you know, that scene, you know, Serena and I are quite highly uh, connected. That's totally granular. But notice we can start aggregating. We can just say not about just, just shocks from me to Serena, but what about shocks from me to everyone else in this room or everyone else to me? You know, so we can start you know, getting much less granular. And th those sorts of ideas may correspond to interesting, um, interesting calculations. <coughs> so um, it's going to be the non-own elements or the non-own variance decomposition, of course, you know, J not equal to I that we're going to care about. And we can put all these, uh, like, OK, I don't know if you can see that laser. But um, at any rate, of course, we can put all these pairwise variance decompositions into a little table, call it a, a variance decomposition table. Um, let's say we have n variables. Th those are the x's. And, and you know, here are the pairwise variance decomposition. Uh, H remind, reminds us what the horizon is. And of course, we've got different i and j. Now, again, again, I can aggregate, as I was just alluding to. Uh, if I sum rows, uh, that's like from everybody else to Mr. 1, or everybody else to Mr. 2, or everybody else to Mr. N. So it's like from others to that row, the person whose row that is. If I sum the columns, of course, it's two others from uh, person 1, or two others from person 2, and so on. And I can take the grand sum off the diagonal. Again, notice all these sums are off the diagonal. Uh, the grand sum, of course, it doesn't matter if you add the row sums or the column sums. You get the, you get the same number. Uh, but that's another. We're going to think of that as total system-wide connectedness. So we're going to call these individual variance decompositions um, pairwise directional connectedness. And then we're going to talk about total directional connectedness from or to others. And then we're going to talk about just total system-wide connect connectedness, the, the, the grand sum. Well, OK, first of all, um, let me. Uh, introduce some maybe tidier notation. So, so C for connectedness, H for horizon, and the, the arrow tells you, you know, which way we're going. <coughs> so f this would be from J to I, horizon H. Uh, that's just a pairwise. Um, notice all these connectednesses have um, kind of like import, export, you know, and if you want to net them out, you know, trade balance type um, interpretations. So, so up here, the pairwise directional is basically, you know, just imports or exports from one country to another. And if you want to net them, it's a bilateral trade balance of, you know, think about imports and exports of future uncertainty, you know, coming to and from various people or firms or whatever in a system. 
And then the total uh, directional, again, we're, we're just aggregating in one way or another. The dot uh, shows us that we've aggregated. So this is from everybody to Mr. I, or from Mr. J to everybody else. Again, we can net them out, <clears throat> and that's just a regular old you know, multilateral uh, trade balance. And again, we might also want to just go total system-wide. That's just total world exports, <clears throat> or total world imports. Again, at the global level, they must equal. So, um, so cool, OK. So you know, we sort of uh, worked out basically what I've said in, in a number of papers. And um, um, you know, there's a book that puts um, a lot of it together in a, in a fairly uh, self-contained way. And, and, and there, this is the most recent published paper. Um, the paper I'm presenting today, of course, is not uh, yet published. But, but they're all very much related. Um, <clears throat> so anyway. Oh, by the way, I, I, at the beginning of the talk, I tried to link up to network stuff and shrinkage and selection and high dimensions and dense and wide, other kinds of, you know, just to see, see, give you some feel for how this fits in. Of course, I think, if I remember correctly, the title of the session was Prediction. We're actually not forecasting, per se, here, although I'm very interested in that, but that's not what this is about. Uh, but you see, the whole measure of connectedness is all about prediction. The measure is you know, a, a variance decomposition of an optimal, uh, or doesn't have to be optimal, but of a forecast error. Okay? So, <clears throat> so I'll, you know, if you're a network person, um, this is just totally trivial or nothing. But it, I know everybody's backgrounds are different. So just a little three-minute tutorial um, on networks. So, ne so I, I, it, as they came up a bit earlier today. So a network. Um, you can talk about what's called a graph. Uh, network models are often called graphical models <coughs> um, here. Um, or uh, uh, and a so-called adjacency matrix, which I'll come to in a second. Uh, either one is a complete specification of a network. Uh, so a network's just a connection of nodes. In this little example, there are six of them. Uh, and links. Okay? And uh, if two people are, connected or are linked, you draw a link. Uh, otherwise, you don't. So think of this maybe. Uh, as a Facebook friend network, okay? So we got six people. If they're Facebook friends, we draw a link. Otherwise, we don't. Now, if I give you this graph, the network graph, you can, of course, instantly make the adjacency matrix and vice versa. That's, you know, so either way. But this is very visual, very graphical. This is very algebraic. The adjacency matrix is just a matrix of zeros and ones such that you put a one if the people are linked and zero otherwise. And the convention is always to have zeros on the diagonal. That's not going to matter for us since we're not going to be using the diagonal anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so that's all a network is. Now, uh, there are lots of issues in terms of centrality and ways of thinking about connectedness and so on in the network literature. But overwhelmingly, and it's sort of obvious, uh, one of them is, is, is at the center of everything. And it's based on what's called the degree distribution. So um, the degree of any node is just its row sum. So in the Facebook example, that's just going to give you the number of friends. right? You add up any row, that's the number of friends. Um, each, each node has a degree. You can look at the distribution of um, those degrees across nodes. That's the degree distribution. Absolutely central to thinking about networks. And its key element, there are other elements, but an absolutely key element of it, of course, is its mean, the mean degree. The mean degree in this example would be the average number of friends. Right? If the average number of friends, other things the same, is very high, well, that's going to make for a lot of connectedness and, and conversely. Uh, and, and without a doubt, you know, the, the mean degree is you know, the key um, so-called centrality measure in the network literature. There are others. It's, given the time constraints, I'm not going to go into them. Uh, but at any rate, um, that's the mean degree. Now, I've sort of been oversimplifying. Okay, what we were just looking at was called an unweighted, undirected network. Uh, but again, if you think about friendships, it's a good thing to keep thinking about. Um, you know, there are different strengths of friendship: uh, some casual, some very intimate, a and also there can be directional aspects. Okay, I might like Serena just a lot more than she likes me. So um, um, you know, that 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 can happen. Um, so, um, so that moves us then into weighted directed networks. So to say with this little example, I just made some colors like black, red, yellow for very strong, somewhat strong, and moderately strong <laughs> links. And I uh, put some arrows on them. I don't know if you can see them uh, at this resolution, but there are arrows around. You can have bi-directional links or just one way, whatever. And this actually is the adjacency matrix that goes with this. And now I, instead of zeros and ones, I made up you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.5, 0 0.3. 
for the three different strands. Notice, by the way, in the original unweighted undirected network, uh, the adjacency matrix must be symmetric. Um, if you're my friend, I'm your friend. There's no, but now that we've got um, you know, directional and uh, weighting aspects, that uh, doesn't have to be true. And in fact, this adjacency matrix uh, is not um, symmetric. Um, <clears throat> that actually is the adjacency matrix that matches up to this graph. Okay, now the only twist is that now um, there are going to be two different degree distributions. We're going to call them, you can see where we're going, we're going to call them from degrees and two degrees, right? Because there's a directional aspect, sending stuff out to others and receiving future uncertainty from, from others. Um, so um, we've got two different degree distributions. The mean is going to be the same, but we've got two different degree distributions. And the actual individual degrees are going to be important for certain things that we do as well. Well, okay, so you can see where, where we're going. What we're going to do, we've got this variance decomposition matrix, okay? We're going to interpret it as the adjacency matrix of a weighted directed network, okay? And uh, what, um, what are all these things? These are the from degrees, sometimes called in degrees in the network literature. These are the two degrees of that network, sometimes called out degrees in the network literature. This, if you put a 1 over n in front of it, is the mean degree. So sure enough, the way, you know, leading ways of, of quantifying network topology um, involving the degree distribution and moments like the mean degree are, are, are exactly what we're doing, as it turns out. So we felt really good about that. Um, and we can kind of walk with a bit more confidence now. Uh, if you're into this, um, or if you're into things like systemic risk, which is one of the examples I gave at the beginning, um, you might know um, there's a lot of talk in recent years about two kind of groups of researchers uh, with different approaches to thinking about systemic risk. And there are more than two. Uh, but one's called marginal expected shortfall. Um, it's all about conditioning on a market event, like the whole market tanks. And the issue is like, what happens to me if the whole market tanks? So I'll say that I'm systemically at, at risk, or, or you know, if I'm more likely to collapse, I'm more sensitive to market events. Um, that's basically, or at least in spirit, that's exactly what our total directional connectedness from is all about. Uh, if, if everybody else takes a bad move, what happens to me? You know, it's from the market to me, okay? The other is what's called COVAR, co-value at risk. It's a multivariate kind of um, extension uh, of value at risk, which is doing a different conditioning. It's conditioning on a firm event, like a firm I uh, has, a, has a bad, or, you know, firm I collapses, has a, has a bad event. What happens to the whole rest of the market? It's going the other way around. So, so if, if Citigroup were to collapse tomorrow, um, what's likely to happen to everybody else? You know, it's, it's, it's going in the other direction. Well, that's, um, of course, um, um, our total directional connectedness to, you know, from Citigroup to everybody else. So interestingly, um, not only does this, this little table link up to uh, different aspects of network um, topology and its measurement, but it also, you know, the different aggregations, uh, not pairwise, but the total directional, of each type map into the leading um, or two leading um, frameworks for thinking about uh, systemic risk. All right, now, so far everything's been in population, of course. There's not been hats on anything, so now we're going to put hats on everything um, and um, talk a little bit about that. So, so we were here, right? I guess I wasn't writing in H for Horizon explicitly here before, but of course, you know, I should have. Um, <clears throat> again, we can do our variance decomposition at, any, at a particular selected horizon or a whole menu, you know, do whatever you want. But, okay, so now we're going to want to estimate this. So um, uh, this is probably much too notationally cumbersome, but all I'm trying to do here is, is, is um, have a notation for one page anyway that um, acknowledges the fact that the true data generating process, B of L here, need not be the same as whatever model I come along and fit, 
okay, um, which has in it some parameters, theta, that I'm going to estimate. And this, this issue came up, of course, this morning as well. So I'm going to, I call the, the models that we fit, uh, and one needs to fit a model to do a variance decomposition, uh, approximating models, and they're most definitely just that, you know, who is it, box, and you know, all models are false, some are useful. So uh, that's, that's certainly my view as well, and hopefully this is useful. Uh, so there's a lot of choices. There's an applied modeling thing, a lot of choices, a lot of knobs to turn, of course, and reasonable people can uh, sometimes disagree, uh, sometimes quite a lot. So I'm going to highlight some of those knobs to turn uh, for you right now, and I'm going to tell you what we do. And we don't just choose randomly, but again, reasonable people might want to try other things. I'd encourage you to do that. So first of all, it sounds mundane, but you know, it's, it's actually important because the results depend on what it is, whose connectedness you decide to look at. We're going to be looking at stock return volatilities for a particular set of global U.S. banks, the 150 um, largest in the world. Uh, now, to get stock returns, they have to be publicly traded, so that takes us down to about 100. Okay, so it's the publicly traded subset of the world's 150 uh, largest banks. Uh, it's really like 96, but I'm going to just call it 100 <coughs> for purposes of this talk. Um, you could do returns, but we like volatilities because in a minute I'm going to make this dynamic. And among other things, we have in mind the potential desirability of tracking movements and connecting this over time because uh, it may shoot up. And we've worked on this for a while now. It turns out that it usually does tend to shoot up in crises, things like that. Everybody runs for the exit at the same time. People get very tangled together, connected. So um, it's not accidental that we decide to look at uh, volatilities. Um, um, I said major banks, it's, they're going to be daily. So these are daily range-based realized volatilities on the publicly traded subset of the world's 150 largest banks. We're going to do a vector autoregressive approximating model. In fact, it's going to be a third order vector autoregression, just you know, vanilla um, linear model. Again, it's going to have time varying coefficients in a, in a minute, so it, that's really quite a nonlinear model. Uh, but at any rate, the, vanilla, the basic approximating model is, is a vector autoregression. You can do other things, whatever your favorite model is. If, you're, if you can defend it, uh, just do it. Um, with the hybrid, you know, the estimation is hybrid insofar as it's a lasso. So lasso is shrinking and selecting. The shrinking is obviously very Bayesian uh, in flavor. Selection, well, could also be Bayesian, but sometimes might have a bit more of a classical uh, feel to it. So, um, and, and again, there are other things you can do to shrink, though, just straight out bays or, or ridge or, you know, whatever, and other ways to <coughs> select um, as well, you know. But anyway, we're going to do a lasso. Um, Identification. To get out of variance decomposition, you have to make an identifying assumption, of course. Um, and, you know, ever since Sims in 1980, the econometrics literature is filled with literally hundreds of different identification schemes and people fighting over their favorite ones um, and so on. Um, basically, the point is to split a variance into parts, you've got to get rid of covariances because, um, <laughs> you know, variances of sums are not sums of variances. Um, which is to say you've got to isolate underlying independent shocks, and that's what the, the identification um, is all about. Um, we're going to use uh, Kupfer on Shin, so-called generalized identification. If you know about that, that's great. If you don't, just we can talk afterwards or, or whatever. Uh, but it has the nice feature, it has to make some other assumptions, but it has a nice feature that, like, unlike a Cholesky factor, you know, for example, uh, identification. It's, it's invariant to ordering. And, you know, we might have very large numbers of, of things, just 100 here, could be much more, and 100's large enough. We don't know, you know, what should come first and second and third and fourth in the Cholesky ordering and so on. So, um, so that's why we do that. Uh, we're going to use a horizon of, of 10 days, just benchmark, you know, in the various papers, we, we of course, check out other horizons. Um, and to understand this, we're going to use network visualization. So uh, basically, to summarize the network topology, you just saw these connectedness measures are actually standard network centrality, you know, mean degree and related, uh, the whole degree distribution. Um, so that's kind of summarization. Uh, but they're no way, they're nothing like sufficient, you know, for the actual network graph or adjacency matrix. To get a, a full picture for everything, it turns out that network visualization is, is crucial. And I want to say, uh, I think there's time. I'm going to say uh, just a little bit about that because it's an interesting point. It took me a long time to realize it. It's obvious, but anyway, maybe you'll appreciate it. 
that is um, back in 1980 when Chris Sims, you know, first began the popularization of, of, of vector autoregressive methods uh, in macro, he very clearly advocated variance decompositions and also impulse response functions, the same information presented differently, um, for, for understanding um, what's going on. The point being that even in a low dimensional, traditionally a four variable uh, vector autoregression, you know, it's still going to have you know, maybe 50 or 60 coefficients in there. Uh, and you it's very hard to stare at 50 or 60 coefficients, especially in dynamic, in dynamic models, and get a feel for how things are interacting and how the dynamics of the system work. So instead, you want to translate them into things that you understand, like, well, how much of the 10 step ahead forecast error variance of variable three is actually due to shocks in variable seven? You know, that's more, or the impulse response question. Suppose a unit shock hits some variable. How does it affect that variable and all other variables when it hits, and then dynamically, you know, as it works its way through the system? Those are the kinds of things that economists are, are used to thinking about. So, so the idea of moving to things like variance decompositions uh, historically was that they, were the key to really understanding what's going on in a vector autoregression. The interesting thing now, you notice that they themselves are completely hopeless. The variance decomposition matrix in, in just this little 100 dimensional example that we're about to do, um, you know, is 100 by 100. It's got 10,000 uh, elements in it. And that's only for a fixed one horizon. You start looking at, you know, so, so the thing that saved the day 40 years ago uh, is itself, um, not saving the day uh, in high dimensions. It turns out that network visualization is great in that regard. Just one page, one picture, you can learn a lot. So, so we're going to go there. Um, so anyway, we, we, there's nothing new at all with the lasso here. Uh, this is just off the shelf. Uh, we have no contribution to the lasso. But just came up earlier today, so you've seen it already in part. But it's just a least squares problem uh, with, a, with a parameter penalty, though. The idea, I like to, as an economist, I like to think of this as a parameter budget. If you set Q equals one, which is, which is the, the lasso, um, uh, then it's just a constraint on the, the, the sum of absolute coefficients. So what that means is if you let one of them get really big, you've got to pull others really close to zero or you won't be respecting the constraint. So it's like a budget constraint in that sense. And, and the nature of the solution um, winds up setting many coefficients exactly to zero and shrinking those that aren't set exactly, exactly to zero. Uh, towards zero. And of course, you can write it in, in Lagrange multiplier form as well. And there's all sorts of cool things uh, depending on what Q is. Q equals two is ridge, famous, famous thing. Q equals one is lasso. Um, as, as you let uh, Q go to zero in an appropriate way, you get straight out selection, like AIC type, type or, or actually be like a SIC type stuff. Um, anyway. Lots of variants. We're going to be doing, where is it? Uh, we're going to do, be doing the so-called adaptive elastic net. Um, there's this adaptivity issue and there's this elastic net issue. Adaptivity just means you, you, you weight up those absolute um, parameter values, typ typically by the reciprocal of the least squares um, estimates. Um, and what that does is it really encourages you to set things whose point estimates of parameters are near zero exactly to zero. And that gets you the oracle property and you know, good things happen. Um, that's what the adaptivity does. The elastic net just blends um, a lasso type penalty with a ridge type penalty. And some people think that that's helpful. So you know we're going to be doing adaptive elastic net. But basically, it's lasso. We're going to be doing it equation by equation. So we're actually not doing a whole system-wide lasso here. Um, at least for us, and I think, I mean, maybe this has changed in the last six months, but uh, it's just computationally um, really, really challenging. So we're doing a, a equation by equation, which has the virtue of allowing for a different lambda. I guess it's a virtue, you know, in each equation, a little more flexibility there. Um, all right. Lots of choices inside Lasso, like, you know, we're going to take an equally weighted average, least squares to get the adaptivity weights. Uh, tenfold uh, cross-validation to select the uh, lasso penalty parameter, and so on. <clears throat> All right. Last thing before we get to the empirical work. Um, just a little bit. So in a minute, we're going to be looking at some graphs like this, OK? Um, don't worry about what that graph is just yet, but there's a color scheme in it. I don't like, these, I don't like color anymore. What I've come to realize, and people like Tufti and others talk about this, um, 
there, there's no natural ordering of color in the human mind. Like you might think like blue for cold and over to red for hot, but, but you, you, there's no natural ordering. So anytime you do a, a fancy graph in colors, like, uh, you're constantly saying, oh, wait a minute, purple was what and brown was what? And you're, you know, it gets what you want to do is grayscale, you know, just from white gray to black or some, you know, some, and then, then it's, there is a very natural gradation. And we're moving to that now. But it happens that in what I'm showing you today, um, it's still in color. So, um, OK, so the node sizes in the graphs, if you notice this graph, the nodes are of different sizes. Uh, I also don't like that anymore because it, it distorts your attention. But at any rate, the node size is total asset value of whatever bank we're talking about. So the big ones have bigger nodes in this, in this graph. And then the, um, the color is total directional connectedness to others, where green is the least and brown or dark red or whatever that is, 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 is very high. Okay? So the uh, colors over here um, are, 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 are those nodes sending a lot of future uncertainty out to the other banks in the system. Okay? Uh, and those are the, oh, and the, the other real, this is really important. The, I call these spring graphs. We didn't invent them, of course, and not everybody calls them spring graphs. But the idea of a spring, so-called spring graph is, um, imagine that these ball, like a physics situation, imagine these, these, these nodes all want to re repel each other. So left alone, they just fly apart, okay? But you don't let that happen. You put springs between them, okay? Where the spring linking any two nodes, um, the, the, the tension of the spring linking any two nodes is proportional, where is it, um, um, to the average pairwise directional connectedness. So, so roughly speaking, any nodes that are estimated to be tightly connected, you put a tight spring, and they're pulled together in the, in the visualization. So that's how it is that the visualization lets you see right away who's connected to whom, what are the clusters, who's way out in the middle of nowhere, stuff like that. <clears throat> okay. So, um, okay. So here's this example. In the paper, there's a lot of empirical work. Um, I mean, this is meant to be much more than a, a, an illustrative example, but for this audience and in general, I, I tend to present it as just a general technology for measuring connectedness with a few slides at the end. But there are many variations on this basic theme that I'm about to show you um, in the paper. Um, so anyway, uh, I, again, realized balls for about 100 big banks, daily realized balls. Um, if this was a more financial audience, I'd dwell on this more, but just maybe some of you are are, are financial. Um, you know, there's lots of ways of th thinking about connectedness and balance sheet cross holdings are a big deal. The problem with them is that you can't get them. And also accounting conventions are very different in different countries sometimes. So th there's not, things aren't comparable across uh, countries. So we're very intentionally um, taking a market-based approach here, uh, which is not to say that markets are always perfect, you know, far from it. Uh, but, you know, the market uh, is filled with very smart people who've devoted their lives to ferreting out just the kind of connectedness information that, uh, that we may be interested in. And, um, you know, if you're going to argue that you know more than the market, um, you know, I wouldn't rush into that. <laughs> so, so um, you know, it is a market-based approach, no balance sheet data, um, but uh, we're more happy than sad about that. I already mentioned the range-based realized balls and, you know, 96 banks. <clears throat> it is 96. 80 plus 14 does not add up. I just noticed that um, earlier this morning. So I'll have to check the paper. But it's a total of 96 banks, very uh, represented all over the world, 23 <coughs> developed economies, six emerging economies. All right. So um, you probably can't read this. Um, from where you're sitting, but um, I can tell you. So this is the network graph, okay, for you know the variance decomposition obtained using all those modeling choices that I've just been going through at a 10-day horizon. Okay, this is static. Okay, this is full sample. The sample, I should have said that, it goes from the early 2000s through the Great Recession almost up to the present. Uh, so you can think of this as like an average, you know, over the, nothing's dynamic yet. It's estimated, but it's not dynamic, right? It's full sample estimation. At any rate, um, it's quite interesting. You might wonder, what's this big cluster? This is every Japanese bank in the sample. 
You might wonder, what's that big yellow cluster up there? That's every Chinese bank in the sample. Immen each of them immensely tightly connected you know, within its own group, but not at all so tightly connected to the rest. Not unconnected either, of course, but you know, it's very, very interesting. What all this is, this is kind of like all the Anglo and European. Like Here's all, um, all US and Canada. Uh, here's Central Europe. Interestingly, around the fringe, you have countries that, even in the journalistic kind of press, are often talked about fringe. You have more crises, more delicate issues. This is Turkey. There's Greece. There's Portugal. That's what's kind of going up around, uh, up around there. Uh, here are, um, here's Australia. That's kind of like England and the US, because it's Australia, but it's also kind of like Asia. <laughs> and it's, so it's interesting uh, where it comes out. And uh, these are other um, Asian. You know, these are the three Korean banks, the two Singaporean banks, two Indonesian banks, two Malaysian banks uh, in our sample. Um, one thing I'll say, we were very surprised to see this. It's like a gravity model, if you know the economics. Um, in, um, Gravity model is all about, it's a trade kind of model, but that where geography turns out to have a very important effect. Just, you know, physical proximity as, as with gravity. Um, so um, I would have thought that the biggest, most sophisticated money center banks, regardless of, um, you know, where they're geographically located, would be the most tightly connected, you know, and conversely. And there's some of that going on if you drill down into this for sure. But you see there's a very strong geography uh, effect as well. Uh, so this is the um, you know unconditional or average um, uh, network topology. Now um, we can bring in government bonds, which is very interesting because there were two European debt crises following the Great Recession. But given the three minutes I have left, I'm going to not do that. Instead, let me um, go dynamic. Um, very simply, we're just going to roll um, the, the the fit. Okay, so uh, it doesn't say it, but I think it's 150, yeah, 150 days. So, you know, every, every day we're going to now estimate uh, the model using the lasso with all the same modeling choices, but just using the most recent 150 days and just sweep through uh, the sample in that way. And if you recall, like our connectedness table, for example, here it is. Remember, the key mean degree is right down here, or the mean degree is proportional to this. So, effectively, this is the mean degree. Okay. Now, um, over a whole sample, that's what we've been looking at you know, so far. Uh, but what we're going to have now, of course, is a different table here every day and a different mean degree, therefore, every day. So I'm going to show you the time series of um, mean degrees. That's what this big heavy line is here. Whoops, sorry. Uh, that's what the big uh, wide uh, line at the top is. And I'll show you, I've got just a minute, so let me just mention a few things. First of all, notice that there are low frequency and high frequency aspects, both of which I think are, interest, are of interest. I put in a piecewise uh, linear trend just to help guide your eye um, in terms of low frequency movements. Um, where's the kink? Where's the maximum in that trend? It's the day Lehman failed. Um, does that necessarily mean anything? No, but it's kind of cool to notice. You know, but you might you might think about this as a, maybe the low frequency increase and then decrease in connectedness. Maybe that's like good connectedness. Connectedness isn't necessarily bad. Risk sharing, enhanced market integration. Uh, you know, so maybe things are getting better in that sense up to the crisis, and then people were trenched, and the trend is downward after that. But notice also in terms of cyclical dynamics around trend, they're there. And the all-time highest value, at least in the sample, of connectedness of, this, uh, of the mean degree is the day Lehman failed. Um, and what's this hump? What's that hump? Those are the two waves of the European debt crisis. And is this just after the fact, or could a real person have done this in real time? No, you can do this in real time. This is financial market data. They don't get revised. You get them instantly. On any given day, you're just using the most recent history of 150 days. So this is exactly what a real person monitoring connectedness in real time would have seen. Um, and um, we think that's interesting. So uh, I could say more, but why don't we just leave it at that. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>